Yeah, hello and welcome everybody. Good morning. Yeah, I would like to welcome you to the first panel of the 11th edition of the Expanded Animation Symposium. My name is Alexander Wilhelm. I'm one of the co-organizers of the Expanded Animation. And the, this year's main topic is the art of performance. Especially the first panel has two uh, talks that are pointing out the main topic. Um, and I will give short introductions to the speakers and will also give a little insight on their talks. If you want to know more in detail, you find every information besides the talks in the program panel with the biography of the speakers in detail. Um, yeah, we are starting with Arts and Industry Panel, uh, which is sponsored by the WKO Oberösterreich. And the first talk will be held by Christopher Salter, who is Professor for Immersive Arts and Director of the Immersive Arts Space at the ZHDK, the University of Arts in Zürich, Switzerland. His artworks have been seen all over the world. So just to point out some, uh, at the Venice Architecture Biennale, Wiener Festwochen, at the ZKM, and the Vitra Design Museum, just to name a few. In his talk, Co-Presence, Co-Extensive Space and Bodily Experience, he will give insights to the theater project Animate that uses XR technology to enable virtual content that is integrated within the surrounding of the real world and keeps the recipient aware of this fact, which is very important in this case. So please welcome Mr. Christopher Salter. Good morning. Um, sorry, I have a bit of a frog throat this morning. It's too many tsipfer. Um, so I'm Chris Salter. Um, thank you for the introduction, Alexandra. Um, so I'm going to talk about Animate, uh, which the subtitle is A Theatrical Exploration of Climate Transformation Through Extended uh, Reality. Um, you heard all this. Uh, before I was in Zurich, uh, I was uh, 17 years in Montreal uh, at Concordia University where I worked in a, as, worked as a professor for computation arts and then also ran Hexagram, which is a, a large network between eight universities and, and the, there's work here as well. We started actually working with Ars Electronica in 2018, although this is my 10th Ars Electronica. I start, came in 1993, so it shows how old I am. Um, this is the uh, immersive art space. If you're interested, it's blog.zhadeka.seha slash immersive arts. Um, the immersive arts space is a, a very large facility embedded in the Department of Performing Arts and Film at the ZHDK. Although it's uh, not a teaching program, it's a research lab. I have 14 uh, researchers, and we had a piece actually the last two days downstairs in the seminar room, Reconfigure. Um, and uh, so it's a cross-departmental lab for research, teaching, and production in numbers of arts. I'm giving you this context to give you a little bit of why I'm, why I'm, why I'm talking about this in this context. So um, this, uh, this is the space, uh, this motion capture and multi-channel audio and all this kind of technical infrastructure. Um, but what is interesting is uh, that we're trying to work on the notion that it's both a physical site, it's a space, and it's a conceptual site to try to explore socially, critically what we mean by immersion, which is a very complicated term and has a long art historical, sociological, and, and, uh, art and anthropological context. Um, and I like to think of it as what, what the sociologist of science, Lucy Suchman, called a kind of place of configuration. And this is interesting, this notion of configuration, because it's about, both she says, how technologies materialize our cultural imaginaries just as those imaginaries narrate the significance of culture. You know, so you have technology and culture always operating in tandem and with one another. 
And what we're trying to do, and I've only been there for a year, so this is quite interesting in a lab which is very much dedicated to technology, is focus on what Philip Agri called a critical technical practice, which is to have an awareness and a reflection on the assumptions, tech ideologies, and values that underline technologies design and use. Sometimes we think that these things came out of the sky, and, and I'm going to prove to you today that they didn't. Uh, you heard all this bio. The only reason I will show you uh, this bio is because I originally, uh, I come from the humanities, social sciences, and also theater. So theater uh, is increasingly important um, for me, actually for a long time, in terms of thinking about uh, what we call new media practice. And this book, which some of you know, is called Entangle, 2010 MIT Press, uh, looks at the history of technology and performance from the end of the 19th century until 2008 across multiple fields, across scenography, um, uh, what we call dance, theater, uh, and then at the end, it's the media art. So you can see essentially the basis for what we call, started in the, let's say, 1960s, once again, uh, immersive uh, computational-based media. Um, and these are two other books you might be interested in that also frame some of these larger questions that Dars Electronic has been dealing with for, for years. And this is the most recent book uh, called Sensing Machines, which again deals with this entanglement between human and technological systems. In this case, uh, sensing systems which are around us, surrounding us uh, every day, and, um, but how do they work in the everyday? Like, how do they work in gaming? How do they work in culture? How do they work while you're sleeping or dreaming or eating? or so on. So I would frame the talk by this quote from um, Anna Viso and again, Lucy Suchman, thinking about the idea of wearable computing. Now, we tend to think about wearable computing as, you know, basically smart watches or smart clothing, but I want to position uh, the head-mounted display, the HMD, in this history. And Suchman and Viso say that the, what's interesting about wearable computing is that it couples humans with computational devices and extends the body's capacity through information processing actually into the world. Not into the computer, but out into physical space. And that's the framing for talking about this project Animate. So um, Animate is, a, we call it a kind of extended reality, I'll get into that term in a second, uh, theater work that crosses performance, radio play, installation, and it's based on a Canadian cli-fi, climate fiction story um, about a, a world transformed uh, by climate change. In fact, when I found this short story, it was written in about 2014, and when I spoke to the Canadian author, Kate Story, I said, well, we have to update to, this, to the present, because it's no longer science fiction. And what it, what it tries to do is explore a kind of mixing of genres between live performance, which is a fundamentally very old form of human expression. It goes back thousands of years, not only in the European theater in Greece, but of course also in Asia or Africa or Australia. And what is interesting is that theater and technology are always this intimately related thing. And so we have live theater and then we have the technological environment of worn um, uh, extended reality to understand this interplay between the physical world we're in and the imaginary world of computational space. So I'm gonna go through these aspects. What is the aim of this project? Uh, what is the story? Because it's, I think, very, very important to understand that we started this project not to display the technology, but to try to tell a story with these new emerging systems. Then I'll give you a bit of a historical context for those who don't know. I, I apologize for those who know some of this history, but I'm sure there's some who don't. I want to talk very briefly about the aesthetic questions, and then the last thing is about the challenges of working with these systems in practice. Okay, so what's the aim? So Animate basically did this, asked this really simple question. Uh, how do you feel climate change in your senses? So um, if you, I just was at a big exhibition in Venice, uh, everything, everyone talks about the weather. It's filled with graphs and showing, you know, increases of CO2, increases of, of, of nitrogen, changes of ice. So it's, it's what we call inscription. It's all about graphs and, and, and so climate change is always talked about in this kind of quantitative way. So we were trying to understand like, well, how could you just deal with this in a very immediate way and not in this kind of um, abstracted inscriptive way? using these emerging 
uh, wearable augmented reality technologies, which are actually quite recent, although you'll see they, they go back historically. Um, but when the Microsoft HoloLens came out about eight or nine years ago and the Magic Leap, these technologies are fundamentally different than virtual reality because they are see-through and they allow you to look into the, the physical world. But of course, they're, they're, they're very problematic because the physical world for these technologies is in front of you, it's not behind you. So for instance, sonically, I'm always aware of what's behind me. Visually, I'm always aware of only what's in front of me. Um, so these, these technologies are very, very early in their gestation period, even though it seems like they are, you know, have been around for a long time. And now let's talk about the story, because this is what's quite interesting. So the story is about uh, two doomed, a uh, love affair, two doomed people, Daniel and Lori, and they're fleeing from a disastrous future of climate catastrophe. And, and they're emotionally distraught, and they flee to, uh, they're in Newfoundland, where I was just in, uh, I was just in, in August, which is in the, the, the northeast part of Canada, off the coast. Uh, it's an extraordinary place because you encounter some of the earliest geological formations on the planet. Uh, this is a fjord-like landscape, but the piece is set here in the Tablelands, and the Tablelands is, so you can see this image, this looks like Norway, in the same park you have this. Now how is this possible? Well, this is an area that is the only place in the world, although I've been told also in Switzerland there are areas in the Alps where you also have these types of geological formations. Um, this is the mantle of the Earth from 500 million years ago. and. Um, how this appeared is the Iapetus Ocean, which was an ocean when essentially the North American continent was one continent called Laurentia. This uh, ocean closed because basically the mantle of the earth under the ocean pushed up and pushed basically heavy metal rocks from the mantle up onto the northeastern seaboard. And this ocean vanished. I mean, this is over 100 millions of years, of course. And what you had was essentially crustal rocks from deep within the Earth. And this is the area where the theory of tectonic plates <clears throat> was proven. And what you have is you have high concentrations in this rock of iron, because on the surface of the rock, it's, 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 it's very, uh, 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 it has a lot of oxidation, and inside you have kind of black green stone. So it's, it, it's quite amazing. I mean, we, we talk about, again, the, the earth changing. It's quite amazing to confront uh, geological time directly in your body by going there. You know? So it's, 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 if you want to understand climate change, go, go, go to Newfoundland. Um, so, Gradually what happens in this story is these two people who have been brought together on a date go to this area, they don't know why, um, the, 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 they, and they're escaping from their emotional pasts, which include divorce and tragedy. And um, they take a walk up into the tablelands. And in the story, this area exerts this magnetic force. So for instance, the character's hair gets pulled back, and they start fighting with each other. And, and, and there's something that kind of takes them over. And so in the last scene of the play, or the, the short story, uh, they arrive at the top of the tablelands, and the earth starts to uh, open up and swallow them. Um, so it's a very, very cheerful uh, story. Um, but what, what's interesting is that it, it, you know, people come out of it not feeling uh, like it's a bummer, but feeling that like, there is some relation between the Earth and us, you know, that there's some force that we can under, un understand. So what I found interesting is like, how could you stage this? You know, which is an impossible thing to stage. How do you stage like, you know, the, the Earth coming alive? And so we thought, well, let's, let's see what we can do with these emerging so-called <clears throat> Augmented reality technologies. I mean, you can just see this. This is just an amazing area. Um, what's also interesting is the greenery only grows at the base because as you go higher, uh, the rock is toxic because it has chromium, it has nickel, it has all very heavy metal in it. <coughs> okay, so this piece is structured in three parts, and I'll tell you why at the end of the talk. The first part is the most basic analog theater. So it has actors in it, you know. And it's very interesting because people come to it to expect a kind of media spectacle or like sitting down for 15 minutes listening to these two people tell you a story and they're a bit confused. 
Um, so the first act is sets place in her tent. You sit on these kind of logs, and you basically hear this story told to you by these two actors. This is um, Steve Carrier and Judith Rosemeyer, who's actually a very, very well known German actress. Uh, this was in the uh, Theater um, Kunstfest in Weimar, uh, in the premiere in August uh, 22. The second scene, um, after you hear this story, when, they, when the two characters say, we're going now, uh, do you want to go to the Tablelands and go for a walk? And he says, of course, you know. I said, well, it's a seven kilometer hike up and back, and it's quite, you know, quite strenuous. Yes, we'll do that. So what they do is they bring the audience out of the space and they bring them into another space. Now, originally this piece was shown in the Kethalle in Weimar. This was the early, the, the largest factory for the production of potato harvesting equipment in East Germany. It's called the Kethalle, so Kartoffel Entefabrik. And um, it's an extraordinary, it's uh, like 500,000 square meters, and we only use a small part of it. Um, but as I talk a bit later, um, these technologies, which we use to the Oculus Quest 2, of course, are meant for your living room, not for a space of thousands of square meters. So that brings all sorts of interesting questions technically and also perceptually up. So the second act of the piece is essentially this group of audience being led with these HMDs on, but led by the actors through this space. And they walk over surfaces of water and, and gravel, and <laughs> we spray water on them. And, and so even though they're in VR, you, you feel collectively your part. And one of the, the problems, as everybody knows, with virtual reality is it's a completely antisocial technology. It blocks off the real world from, uh, from this computationally generated one, which is, for me, completely dull, because you know, the real world's more interesting than computer animation on my head. And the, so this was in Italy. We just did this in a Pestum cell for a very large theater festival in Naples. So another kind of space, you know, again, not meant for uh, home technologies like the Oculus Quest. So people basically kind of travel through this space, have no idea where they are, but they're in this virtual world, which is uh, quite, um, well, I'll talk about the aesthetics in a little bit. And then the final uh, scene is they come back to where they start, and the Oculus Quest opens up into what we call pass-through mode. And anyone knows what pass-through is. Pass-through is a simply a technology I'll talk about later, which is taking the video cameras, which are used for tracking the Oculus Quest, and seeing actually into the physical world. Now, it's a very grainy black and white image, which I find very interesting. And in the last scene of the piece, um, they have reached the Tablelands, and they talk about, uh, you know, they, 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 they start feeling something, uh, and then the character Daniel throws a st stone and says, I really hate it here. You know, I, just, I hate this island because it's so cold in the winter. Newfoundland's very cold. It's cold between October and May. There's snow on the ground and in these mountains the whole time. And they throw these stones, and then the characters start laughing. And it's the only time in the play that these two characters come together. Because before, they're just separate the whole time. And so in the moment of embrace, the earth opens up. And so basically what happens is you have this kind of scene where these rocks in the physical space, of course, in the virtual space, mix together. And so these rocks are swarming around you. And at the same time, um, the sound, which is basically kind of a radio play happening on the headsets, moves out into the physical environment. So you lose this space, and you become aware of that space and this space. So you're in this constant tension at the end between what perceptual field am I in? Am I in? a real world, or I am in a virtual world, or I am in a mix, you know? So, so that, that's a little unanimated. I'll just show you just quickly the trailer, just to get us, let us sense of the emotional tenor of the work. So the sound was done. So we originally made a radio play for Deutschlandfunk uh, in Dolby uh, Atmos, which is the first kind of spatialized audio piece they've uh, uh, broadcast. Um, there's the Tablelands, which I was just recording when I was there. So here's the first act, which is this, as I say, very, this is in Italy, this is very emotional um, storytelling. I want to see the tablelands. And then they, that's the space in, 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 in Weimar that they go into. Uh, so when you start walking in this kind of virtual world, you start feeling vibrations outside of your body um, down to 17 hertz using very large scale uh, Meyer Some people call it the soul of the earth. And so the VR is very kind of cloudy and you can't really see Maybe. what's going on. And, and then, as I said, the rocks kind of rise out of the ground. And 
hit the surfaces of the real space, because we, of course, scan the real spaces. So these virtual things interact with the physics of the real world. This is a bit jerky because all this can only be delivered over Wi-Fi and recorded due to, due to Meta's uh, privacy control. Okay, now that's a little bit about the piece, but why do this with these technologies? Um, so we have this term XR. In fact, right now there's this critical XR manifesto here being announced. What is this term, extended reality? What do we mean by this? So this is basically an umbrella term that comes in the mid-2000s that describes essentially computer-generated environments that are experienced through headsets or bodily uh, interfaces. And these environments, and, and again, I apologize if you know this, but there, I'm sure some don't. So there's Mr. Zuckerberg. So this is VR. Now, Mr. Zuckerberg is not the inventor of VR, I have to tell you, as you probably know. Um, he pretends he is, just like Tim Cook pretends that Apple has invented a term called spatial computing, which I will talk about in a second. So VR, what is VR? Well, basically VR is putting you in a completely computationally generated world. There is no outside. So in fact, the space you're in is irrelevant to what you experience. And then there's AR, you know? And now these, of course, are computational co computer science terms. What is augmented reality? Well, traditionally, augmented reality is the overlay of information onto the physical world. And as you know, quite up until quite recently, you would carry around a laptop and iPad or whatever and look at the world and you get information about it. Okay, so that's essentially kind of this classic idea of information overlaid. And then, of course, there's this famous chart from Milgram and Cascino in 1992 about mixed reality. And that's the term that's really interesting. What does it mean, mixing reality? Well, mixed reality is not a point, but it's a continuum from what we call the real environment to what we call the virtual environment. The real being I'm here in the physical world, and the virtual is I'm in this uh, world of pixels, which of course operate on my perception. Without my perception, there are no pixels. And then you have this kind of in-between stage between augmented reality and augmented uh, virtuality. Um, now, why is this important? Well, the interesting thing is, is that as these new technologies of worn augmented reality come online, most researchers don't have a clue of what people do with these technologies. So Jeremy Balinson at Stanford and his group uh, basically in a recent article said, we don't know how people socially interact in these systems, which is interesting considering they are becoming more and more uh, ubiquitous. But as, as the introduction uh, as, uh, said, um, the interesting thing is if we are no longer completely closed off wearing these devices from the real world, the challenge, as Ronald Azuma said, and as he said, the most important challenge facing augmented reality is that virtual contract content is integrated with the surrounding real world while users remain engaged with and aware of that real world. And this is the thing that most people don't get. Because it's assum assuming that we just go in the virtual world. And I was just at the Venice Immersive Show, and one piece I saw, you know, you're in virtual reality, and then finally the, the person says, Welcome back <laughs> after the experience is over, after eight, eight minutes. Welcome back. And I said, well, welcome back to what? I didn't leave the world. I was sitting on this beanbag the whole time. I was aware of how I moved on this beanbag. I was aware of the fact that um, everything was you know, calibrated in front. And if I want to turn my head, that things you know, went off kilter and so on. So this, I think, is an extremely important comment. Because if we are not aware of the physical world, we have some problems. Now, you know this. So in the same way that Mac introduced us to personal computing and iPhone introduced us to mobile computing, <clears throat> Apple Vision Pro will introduce us to spatial computing. This marks the beginning of a journey that will bring a new dimension to powerful personal technology. To tell you about the experience of using Vision Pro, here's Alan. Okay. So spatial computing. Well, I have to tell you, Tim Cook and Apple did not invent this term. It goes back to the early 2000s from a researcher at MIT who talked about the idea of computing with a machine, which a machine retains and manipulates reference to real objects and spaces. Now, this sounds also new. Uh, everybody knows this place. It, used, it was next to my former graduate school, Stanford. Um, this is a park, Palo Alto Research Center. It's no longer really owned by the Xerox Corporation. Um, 
why is Park important? Well, it's also because of Mark Weiser, who passed away in 1999. Uh, Mark Weiser is, of course, the inventor of what we call ubiquitous computing. And in the 1980s, uh, Xerox was working on the office of the future. And this office of the future was the idea that you would have tabs that you attached to surfaces and things. And so, of course, Hiroshi Ishii was later part of this. And, and, uh, and then these things would become smart, okay, as we call it. And um, what's interesting about Weiser's vision of ubiquitous computing is that computing would essentially, that's, that's the office of the future, which is, doesn't look very much like the future, but um, computing would disappear. And if you haven't read this article, you should read it, The Computer in the 21st Century. Because if you read this, you will get a sense of the world you're in now, even though this was written in 1999. Specialized elements of hardware and software connected by wires, radio waves, and infrared will be so ubiquitous that no one will notice their presence. Now what's interesting is that Visor ends the article with a very famous statement. He says, quote, machines that fit the human environment instead of forcing humans to enter theirs will make using a computer as refreshing as taking a walk in the woods, unquote. And what this suggests is what is called in sociology of science the naturalization of computing. This idea that the natural, in, computing needs to take the natural environment, and this term natural is of course problematic, into account, and it suggests an extremely powerful idea that interaction with machines is not only through inscription, through writing and language, but through our bodies, okay? And this is something we just don't really think about because we're so naturalized to think that computing is about our eyes and our hands you know, and maybe sometimes our hands moving in space, but not really about our, our bodies. And if we think about our bodies, it's what soci so sociologists and psychologists call sensory motor action, ways of interacting with the world that involve the sensory and the motor parts of uh, our se second nature. This is what uh, Francisco Varela called inactive cognition or inaction. Inaction is this idea that there's a purposeful dynamics between our action and our perception in the world. The world is not just given representationally, it emerges as we act in it, as we move in it. And the interesting thing about virtual reality in the history of media technologies is it is the only technology to involve bodily movement, radio, the telegraph, uh, film, uh, and, and other technologies all are things at a distance. They involve us sitting and listening, watching, and so on. Which is ironic because, of course, uh, all the film festivals like Venice Immersive and Tribeca, they want to situate immersion in the history of film. And this is, for me, completely idiotic because virtual reality has nothing to do with film except the fact that it has moving images, you know. Um, the only thing it might be connected to in film is things like Circle Vision 360 in the 1960s from Disney where you have 360 degrees. But again, you're standing in a real room with screens surrounding you. Um, but that gets to larger questions about immersion. So I think what's interesting is that when these technologies suggest that movement in the world is key to computation, you go to what Gibson called the relationality of interaction. That interaction is a relational process between our bodies and the world. And this gets us to this. What is this? Well, this is the guardian. For anyone who's ever programmed an Oculus Quest, this is your friend, the guardian. And what is the guardian? Well, the guardian is essentially the area of experience. The device knows we're in this area, and when you step out of it, you get to the wall, and this virtual wall comes up saying, you're leaving the experience, right? Um, and this kind of stupid wireframe shows up. And if you walk out of that wireframe, you end up in the real world. And you end up in, what happens is like a camera comes on and says, oh, I'm now in the real world, and so I don't run into the wall. <laughs> Um, so you've, you know, you've broken the illusion of immersion. You know, you've broken this idea that I'm in this fixed space and now I'm going out into the real world. And um, in the end of 2001, um, Meta uh, basically enabled developers to access this video feed to do something with. They didn't really state what, but you could basically take this video feed and try to manipulate it. 
In other words, you could embed a virtual object, and so if you take a game engine like Unity or Unreal burns up these devices, so we just say take Unity, um, you basically can embed a virtual object into this video feed. Now, this video feed is a kind of weird like layering, so you can occlude these objects, and it is a lot of technical problems. But the interesting, this is a cube like, floating in this room, okay? And this pass-through is, is kind of interesting because this pass-through creates, basically disrupts immersion, right? Because it gives you the grainy image of the real world, uh, and it's like, well, that's not immersive. Like, that looks like a video feed in front of my eyes. In fact, it's not stereoscopic, so it feels flat. It feels like you're looking at a video feed. But then when you walk, you suddenly feel like I'm walking in a 2D world. This doesn't make any sense, and things pass by me. So it's like, this doesn't make sense. This is a perceptual distortion for our bodies that just doesn't make any sense. And also, of course, uh, Meta, because they want to maximize profit, uh, use very, very cheap cameras. So when you, you, know, the, when you get close to things, they, they kind of warp. And so it's a totally weird thing. It feels like the early days of television, or the early days of video art, which is really interesting because um, when television was being invented in the 1920s, 1930s, and then slowly becoming, uh, going uh, out into the world in the 40s and 50s, uh, they certainly did some 10, 10 billion uh, US dollars in research on it. So that's the kind of pass through. You know, you interact, you can not only put virtual objects, you can actually interact with them with hand tracking and these various types of sensing. Now, what I think this does is ask a pretty fundamental question uh, in a phenomenological sense, in an experiential sense, which is how is the sense of presence of oneself and others reconfigured by these technologies that actually seek full body experience? So in other words, what's interesting is when you see this pass through, <clears throat> you're seeing the real world, right? And you're also seeing other people in the real world. So they're not avatars. But they are mediated, right? Because they're mediated by electronics. But this is really strange because it's not suddenly virtual. It's some weird mix. You know, it is a kind of mixed reality between the virtual and the real. Uh, now, um, <clears throat> this all sounds, of course, radical and new. And of course, most of you know these two images, uh, but they're from 1968, if you don't. Um, this is the famous HMD head-mounted display uh, designed at the University of Utah by Ivan Sutherland, who's one of the founders of computer graphics. Um, it weighed two and a half tons. It was hanging from the ceiling and, and so on. Um, but what's interesting is uh, Sutherland described in a 1965 text, which is one page. You can find it easily online the ultimate display. He said, half silver mirrors in the prisms through which the user looks allow him to see both the images from the cathode ray tubes and objects in the room simultaneously. Thus, displayed material can be made to hang disembodied in space or to coincide with maps, desktops, walls, or the keys of a typewriter. And uh, this is 1968, uh, so this is that device, and, and you'll see in one second that this uh, device is not only uh, virtual, it's actually uh, looking into uh, the physical space. So in other words, there's a computational uh, element uh, embedded into that device. There's a box from Digital Equipment Corporation, a company that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and you, know, you have this kind of virtual cube floating in this, in this, in this physical space. Now, what's interesting is that um, if suddenly you have this break between the immersiveness of the of the you know, computational world, and you have this insertion of the computational into the real, you have the conditions in which humans interact with each other face-to-face -face and body to by. You have a new form of what's called co-presence that the sociologist Irvin Goffman coined in the 1960s. And what is interesting is that the, there's a differentiation between the virtual experience of being in an environment even when one is physically situated in another, that's what we understand as virtual presence, and the sense of taking the perspective of a camera in a real space. So presence is usually, in virtual reality over the last 30 years, is seen as, quote, outwardly dislocated from its physical setting. Uh, and now what I'm convinced of is that these new kind of mixed technologies that we wear will shift toward this mix between the digitality of VR and the concrete reality of our surroundings. And this is actually not researched yet. And so we start actually in Switzerland uh, a four-year research project on this question. What are the futures of XR 
in terms of social interaction, what happens when people see different things but are in the same physical located, co-located space and, and so on. Uh, all right, uh, I have about seven minutes. I'm, I'll go back to animate for a second. And I'm just gonna go to the end. Uh, what are the challenges of doing this? So now we have, you know, we have these kind of technological imaginaries of the virtual and the real, the technologies that enable this mixing, all these kinds of things. So as an artist, what do you do with them, okay? And if you embed them in a, in a form which they don't emerge from, what are the challenges? Okay, so the, as I said earlier, uh, first the first challenge is if you take these devices out of your living room, you're gonna have a lot of problems um, because the tracking systems are not meant for large-scale environments. But there's something else that's more important, and it's what I call the vitality gap, and we can talk later about this, but I think it's extremely important. So what is the key idea of performance, live performance? It is this real-time experience of human beings acting, enacting a world, right? So moving, changing their rhythms, their timing, you know, this kind of thing. Those are what actors do really well, right? So the psychologist Daniel Stern, sorry, I'm coming back one, uh, has this idea of the vitality effect. And he asks, how is it that we feel the world is alive? Like, why do we feel things are alive? Why do we feel, for instance, when we look at these kind of AI displays, that there's some liveness in them? And he says that there's a relation between the physical action of things in the world and the mental operations in our brain, and there's a kind of time locking. So things that move, he's interested in movement, right? Things that move feel alive to us. Things that change, things that have what he calls time curves, time dynamics, that have very sophisticated uh, shapes. Um, so he looks at questions, things like, like when you sit down, like, okay, I'm sitting down in this chair, and uh, as I sit in this chair, like, when will I jump up? Like, like the, they, when, when does that happen? And how do you graph that? You know, that's intensity over time. So he's looking at what are the shapes of time that make up living systems, which is a very, very interesting question. And the thing is, is that when you, now this is a stupid uh, editor from Unity. Um, and anyone who's used Unity knows like you have two modes. You have the edit mode and you have the play mode. So, you know, this is meant for making games. You, you edit stuff, and, and then you play it, and you see if it works. But what if you want to change it in the play mode? Well, you can, but it doesn't save anything. Okay. Now, what happens if you're working with live performers, and some people are wearing HMDs, and you're, someone's programming this, and they're trying to respond to the action of performers. So, for instance, you're watching these performers, and the performers have to interact with virtual things that the performers can't see because they're not wearing, <laughs> they're not wearing the HMD. Well, the problem is, is that these systems are not real-time. So anyone coming from computer music knows that uh, real-time emerges after mainframe computing in the early 1980s. So musicians wanted, you know, m m improvisational music is about real-time. You know, it's about changing action and responding to behaviors. And, um, and so you develop software that you can change parameters in time to adjust to the tempo and actions. And that's what live performance is. But these systems are brittle, that's what we say in computing. They are brittle in the sense that they are not responsive to the actions of, of human bodies. And this is quite important because if you're in a live performance creation context and you're trying to work with these kinds of brittle softwares, you will run into a wall. So for instance, originally we imagined an animate people wearing, the audience wearing the devices and moving back for about 40 minutes and going back and forth between virtual reality and mixed reality and augmented reality and, and the actors performing and you're hearing them uh, wirelessly over the headset and a lot of quite complex technical stuff. And we realized that this was impossible because to build um, a computational environment that would respond as fast as these performers was quite difficult. So this suggests something 
important. It suggests that the dynamics of live performance and the dynamics of authoring computational environments that suppo support that performative context uh, is still a big, uh, a big area uh, of research. I'm going to finish in the last minute with um, a quote. And uh, I mean, you know, one of the things I'm interested in in my new lab is trying to work with, with performers, dancers, and actors, and technologists to figure out, well, how do we address these problems? Because when you take an environment that's meant for something else and you apply it to another situation, which artists do all the time, uh, you're going to constantly run into this, this barrier, you know, this barrier of timing, this barrier of liveness, you know, because that's kind of what we're after in live performance is, like, the liveness uh, of, of the real world um, that is then complemented or extended or defamiliarized by the liveness of the virtual world, that these things interact uh, with each other in really powerful ways and not banging your head against the wall. So I just read you the end. Um, I find this review kind of interesting. This is a review from the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung of the piece uh, in uh, on the Nine, uh, the, the 10th of uh, September in 2022 from, uh, from Kevin Hunchke, who I talked to afterwards. So he said, this year the, the Kunstfest Weimar is focusing on the utopias of the future. And you, of course, you've heard a lot of utopia probably in my talk. And it's included pieces that talk about climate change, political polarization, and new social systems. Animate is one of the boldest ones. In this immersive production, the latest generation of virtual reality glasses is used to tell a dystopian love story that blossoms and shatters in the midst of climate change. The text comes from Canadian author Kate Story. Lori and Daniel, the main protagonists, are newly divorced and come together in their loneliness. Both are traumatized by past relations and experiences. Their homeland has been destroyed by climate catastrophe. And it's very interesting, because I was just in Newfoundland, as I said, and over the radio, over the CBC, what do I hear? The fires that have evacuated Yellowknife and burned up uh, the resort of Kelowna in British Columbia. Their homeland has been destroyed. Stoic and amazed at the same time, they admire the vast forests, the blue rivers, and the proud mountains in this fragment of a play. Quote, this endless expanse, just endlessness, unquote. While the sound plays, the audience of 10 is led through the hall on a rope in a one-hour time slot. Um, the actors and the audience come together and ecstatically experience the story, and the actors perform in harmony with a digital reality. While she balances on the stones, which are real and not, and always close to the abyss, Daniel falls into a depressive trance, despairing more and more. I'm finished. We're finished, he says in a sobbing voice. The industrial hall with all its natural obstacles provides a surreal backdrop. In the virtual reality part of this performance, the images blur, the chirping of birds turns into a booming bass sound, and boulders seem to be moving around. At that moment, this performance begins to fulfill its immersive promise. Now the rope is put down. The audience moves freely in the space, following and dodging whirling rocks, which are both there in the glasses and not there in the real world. With their hands, they try to fend off the debris, which really works thanks to the latest VR technology. Animate, realized with technology from Meta, I like this last line, gives a foretaste of theater 10 years from now. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. I guess we're running, running out of time, so we maybe summarize the Q&A with the next session. And yeah, we are coming to the next talk with Flavia Mazzanti and Manuel Bonell. Uh, they both have a background in architecture and are now the founders of their company, Imeria. They focus on VR games and interactive installations, and they will give an insight on the interdisciplinarity approaches in creative industries. Based on the experience they make by shifting the boundaries of immersive and interactive technologies, using experimental animation 
interactive installations and hybrid performance. Thanks for being here. Yeah, so hi everybody and thanks for having us. We're really excited to be part of the Expanded Animation Symposium this year. Um, so yeah, we are Flavia Manuel and we are media artists and two of the co-founders of Emiria. Very short about us, uh, Manuel and I come from a background in art and architecture, so we met, met at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna uh, where we did our masters and we started working professionally together in 2018 uh, in a variety of media art projects, also often together with um, Manuel's brother, Michel, uh, who's a programmer. And in 2021, we started our company, Miriam, with the vision of creating projects with high artistic quality and level of experimentation, mainly focusing on VR games and interactive installations. So this is a quick overview about our projects. Uh, they mainly range from uh, experimental filmmaking to VR installations or interactive installations in general. Um, we do a lot of hybrid performances and um, procedural animations and also VR development. Um, our style is pretty um, abstract. We work a lot with point cloud aesthetics, lines, movements and so on. Let's talk. Um, we'll, we'll focus mainly on the topic of art and performance. Uh, we have a variety of projects where performance was involved in mainly as a, a main aspect of the project itself or as part of it. Yeah, so it's also important to, for, for us to say that um, even when the, like the output of the projects is completely different, sometimes it's an installation, other times it's an animation or experimental film, or it's a performance itself, for us it's always important from starting from the concept. So the conceptual approach is very important for us. And first, we try to define what is important, what is our vision with the project, and only afterwards we decide which kind of output and also which kind of digital technology we will use to, uh, to uh, realize that project. Uh, so all of our projects have something in common conceptually, with, which is always trying to understand this relation within ourselves and our environment. So we often start from post-anthropocentric uh, theories and also new materialist theories. Uh, we are very in, um, influenced by uh, um, uh, writings by Donna Haraway, also Anna Singh, uh, mentioning just some of them. Uh, and this is especially like the case of Sympoetic Bodies, for example. Um, which is uh, a short film, a hybrid short film we realized between 2019 and 2020. Um, here I worked with, um, I was the writing and the director of the film, uh, Manuel was work, working as a CGI artist, and um, the project itself uh, is an exploration of the disruption of the boundaries uh, between the human body and its social and physical surroundings. And um, here I was really interested in this relation of the boundaries between the human body um, and how also understanding this interaction with the surroundings and how we can start from something which we already know, uh, which is our own body in the physical space, and from this point to explore it also through the use of different technologies and to reach um, new perspectives um, uh, and open also uh, the eyes to the audience in a very also um, experimental way. Um, so, as mentioned, like, it's also always important for us starting from the concept, so this is actually how the project started after uh, months of research, so it was a lot of sketching, drawing, still not having defined anything like what kind of technology are we going to use to reach uh, this kind of uh, um, fragmentation, also like this dissolution of the body, uh, and so on. Um, so this is, these are then uh, two stills of the film um, where it's always so strong the relation between something which is um, the physical body uh, as we know it and then uh, another body which is also a, a physical one but like really um, taken from the physical world with motion capture, further animated and uh, post-process it in the digital. So I will just show you the, the short film, uh, the, the, short, the, the trailer, just for you to have an idea about uh, the feeling.
I explore the limits of my body, where the inside becomes the outside, and the outside the inside. Replicating, disrupting, dissolving. You mentioned uh, before um, we show you a little bit of the making of and how everything was put together. Um, is that everything that you see in the film, the, fi the film is 11 minutes long and everything that you see actually comes from the physical world. So both the bodies, all the organic shapes, uh, as well as the uh, environments were Look, shoot in physical locations, uh, in mock-up studios, in places in Vienna. Uh, so it was so important for me that everything really comes from the physical world. And it's like the starting point, not digitally um, created, but just digitally post-processed. Yeah, here you actually see the behind the scenes of the motion capture. Um, basically, we were not interested to capture the movements and then to apply it to an avatar to have a real one-on-one -on -one translation of the movement themselves to a digital figure. But our intention was to capture the movements on a really abstract way. So to really focus on the movement of the single joints throughout the space, trying to create some abstract line formations rather than um, body movements themselves. And here you see how we translated it. There is a small layer of a human skin, really slightly um, you don't even notice really at the end of the, um, of the composition. But what you really feel is this movement through time and space. And this was something we experimented a lot with in this film to really capture how the person goes through space, how the space changes by moving of the, of the person. Further in the film, as Flavio mentioned, um, we took all the resources from the real life environment and we worked a lot with point cloud scans, meaning we had a professional 3D scanner and we captured uh, different places in the city of Vienna. And these this scans, you can imagine them as a 3D relief, relief of the environment. And what was really interesting for us was to not take these fragments as static elements, but trying to understand how we can further manipulate them so that they become more liquid, more alive, also trying to experiment with transforming them, so from one place to the other one, so that everything you see in the, in the film or in the real world is nothing static, it's always in change. We wanted to emphasize the um, transformation of, of things, that everything is, is alive, is in movement. Uh, further, we were also working with um, deaf sense for filming, and this was really exciting for us. It's basically the same aesthetic as the point cloud scans, but um, each scan, I mean, there are 30 scans per second in that sense, and you have a, um, a film sequence. And really interesting was then to merge this, these two parts together. So we have on one hand the depth sense of filming with the Kinect sensor, and on the other side we have these 3D scans which are transformed, evolving, and, and both then are combined together. Uh, further, it was really interesting for us to experiment with uh, smaller details. So we took um, uh, different photos or film um, shots from smaller elements like this radiator, for example, here, and tried them to scale them up. So here is an example, a camera flying through this radiator, and you as a viewer, you have a completely different feel of perspective. Here you see the final shot, it's you, you fly through and this um, element at the end looks like a tree, but at the end it was uh, basically a tube of the element. So playing with this uh, sensation of perspective, of scale, was also an um, um, important part of the, of the film itself. Also something uh, to mention that the film itself was uh, showing a variety of contexts, not only in film festivals. So every time which was a media art festival or an art gallery, uh, we were trying also to show the making of films uh, or making of videos to, uh, because like the exploration or the experimentation itself is always as, as important as the final output for us. So it's really important that we also are able to show the process or what was like the, the idea behind uh, everything.
this is another project where we worked also on the intersection of performance and animation film. Um, the name is Reaktion, and we worked here together in, um, with a uh, Verein uh, Speakerat, Verein für Kunst und Kulturprojekt, uh, which is based in Vienna. Uh, so Reaktion is actually a project by Spikerat, uh, and it started as a sequence or a series of uh, performances in public space, uh, dealing with topics of homeland and human rights. And here uh, we work together uh, with performers, and they were interested in not only have a physical performance, but to bring an additional layer uh, through a hybrid animated short film. Um, and uh, we were here interested um, not only in capturing the movements uh, of the of the performers, but to add an additional layer, having like this uh, bl through the blurriness and um, uh, of their faces, and also not wanting to expose uh, the performance themselves because the topic is also really delicate. We wanted to. Um, to transmit the emotions, actually, and also to work with this data in a kind of experimental way. Um, so maybe you, you want to some, some, say something about the process? Yeah, so basically here the performance itself was the, the goal of, of the filming. And we were there on the site with the performers. And um, all, every time they do the performance, it involves a certain degree of spont spontaneity. So it means they, they don't act on a, on a script, but they act on their emotions, on their feelings, on impulses. And our goal here was to capture these moments also in a really um, spontaneous way, in the sense that we did not plan where we put the camera, but we tried to um, understand how the performance moves what kind of things um, they want to show us, what kind of emotions they want to deliver, and based on that to position our digital camera in the space and um, to, to capture the moments of the performance. It was also really exciting to work with them because they never um, tried something in between physical digital or this translation into a digital figure. And it was uh, interesting to see that most of the time they tried to watch on the screen but this is something we, we wanted to avoid because you have to focus on your performance and not what you see in the... <laughs> but it was really exciting to work with them. Yeah, and this is actually um, a current project that we finished this year, uh, which is called Beyond My Skin. Uh, and this is, uh, we tried here to bring the layer of performance to, uh, to a new direction and uh, to, until now we saw like more mostly films uh, or animations where like the audience or the role of the audience is to sit and also to enjoy um, the, what was done in that process. And for us it was also interesting what it was experiment in the case of having the audience itself being part of it in real time. Uh, so actually Beyond the Skin is a real time installation uh, which is also shown uh, as a live performance. Um, and these are multi-user experience, so it works with two people. Um, so this is, um, these are some uh, images. So the idea behind was also starting from after COVID and also with a digital era, like also with, uh, the, with the book um, Fenne Körper, uh, Beziehungen in, um, na Berührung in um, Alltag, I think. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, distant bodies, uh, the feeling of touch in everyday lives. And um, it's, was the question not only about performance, but also how can I interact with somebody uh, being physically apart or also in the same space, but not interacting physically, but through another layer, which is the layer of the avatar. So I see myself um, um, uh, reacting or my movements, which are in real time transformed in this, into these abstract formations, but I also see the movements of the other person at the same time, also in abstract formation, and how can I interact in a new way and uh, this was a really exciting process for us. Um, we worked uh, from last year until May of this year, and we, the performance was at the Angewandt Interdisciplinary Lab um, on the 4th of May. Uh, and we are going to exhibit this project also at the Steirische Herbst in Graz uh, for two months uh, at the Esk Medien Kunstlabor, uh, starting two weeks. And we will have also a, a live performance on the 5th of October. Um, so actually, the project itself, uh, it's meant for the audience and then you would maybe question what is the purpose of the performance itself for I think for me the performance it was still being able to transmit also the concept behind 
to having kind of something uh, in this 20 minutes performance to transmit the message of the pro project itself, of this uh, narration between being distant apart and, and getting close to each other uh, before letting the audience um, explore and also enjoying in a playful way uh, with this installation. Uh, I will show you, um, so this is uh, again uh, from the uh, performance, so you see uh, there are like the two performers which are not looking at each other, um, their movements are reflected on the screens and they basically interact uh, with each other on the screen. And I think here it was a bit different from Reaction, where we didn't want to have the performers looking at the screen, in this sense here we really want them to look at the screen and to interact with it and not e even almost um, like you create this digital room, this hybrid space, because you is inavoidable that you also have to look at the physical space and to interact with it, but you also add an additional layer, which is not only just the um, representation of it, but it's really a new space in itself. Um, and it was also really exciting for us to work with the performers and to see how they would adapt the movements also to how uh, the, the installation itself is reacting. I will show you um, a snippet from our short trailer. So what is actually uh, also very important for us, it was not, on one hand having this camera which is like showing the body itself um, and this is an abstract way because for us it's always this not having this one-to-one -one representation of the body uh, but just going beyond and showing some I think my microphone, okay, uh, which is uh, going beyond um, and, and having a really abstract configuration. So how does it feel? does it feel for me to be now like this, to have not like to see myself in my arms um, or my foot or so on, but really see myself also in form of lines uh, from a top view. So my movements create space in the space and, and interact with me and interact with this other person and we create lines together. At the end we merge and we don't know anymore um, who is who. Uh, this was something which was uh, really exciting for us. And um, Another thing that I wanted to say before showing a little bit of the uh, making of um, is also that, um, um, yeah, it was interesting for us also to explore the moment of the touch itself. And the touch is a really metaphorical way because you don't really touch in physical in the physical world, but you, there is a moment in the installation where if you come too close to the screen and also the other person, they will touch. Uh, in the digital world. And in this moment there is a trigger, so it's kind of, it's, it's a feedback or something for you also performing or also just moving in space, like, oh, this was now, I, I touch this person and what does it mean to touch without really physically touching? Uh, it was also something that we wanted to explore with this installation. So for the process uh, itself, um, we worked in a team of uh, four, four or five people. And we had programmer, technical artists in the team and this was a um, really challenging project, actually, because it was um, the idea of abstracting this body um, and trying to define specifically this involvement of, of the touch in the digital. So we were experimenting a lot. What does this touch mean? Do this body merge? How do we show this merging? How abstract do we want to have the, the bodies? Because at the end, we wanted to have something in between, not completely abstracted, like you see just lines or something really blurry but that you still see the silhouette of the body, that you still feel, okay, this is my arm, this is my leg, I have some kind of control over the movements, but at the same time, I don't recognize myself completely. I don't know my gender, I don't know my skin color, I, I have no, all the, all the adjectives I have in the physical world might be gone in this, in this realm. 
And we tried a lot between um, the depth sensor point clouds, the lines, trying to trace the movements again, what we saw already in previous projects. And it was a lot of back and forth and also trying to figure out how to make this mirroring. So basically, when you saw in the video, when the performance go apart, in the virtual space they come together. So it's actually you, you think in a different way. When you go closer to the screen, you come closer to the person, but physically you distance yourself. So the, um, the level of the performance happens in the digital. Or in between realms, yeah. that it was also the, the, the idea behind too. Uh, and, and yeah, as you said, it's on the one hand, like having the installation, we also are really curious to see like how different people just experiment or play with it. Um, and then having like the performance more to really transmit this idea of, of touching and, and physical and digital um, and distance, yes. So the camera switch was really interesting to experiment with. So basically, um, you see yourself from the side view, from the front view, and you have this perception of the body. Once we switch to the top view, you get on a more abstract level. You, you focus more on your movements in the space rather than your limbs moving towards something else. So when we, once we switch to the top view, we also recognize that the performance itself changes. So the performers try to move differently in the space. They use more the corners, more the sides of the, of the space itself. And for us, it's really beautiful to, to track these movements and to see, to observe it, how they, they move around, what's happening when they touch, what kind of um, images they create while moving. And I think for us, it's always something which we love to explore, as also our background is from architecture, is this influence in space, and also how space not understood just as a static element, but how we can influence space, but also influence, space influences us and our movements and also our way of being here um, in this between realms, between digital and between physical. And um, which is something that we like to explore in a dif different ways. So this is one way with the uh, interactive installations, uh, but also uh, something which we are really fascinated is also the virtual space or virtual reality, uh, because it's also a space where you're not only just seeing yourself projected and interacting, but you are fully immersed in. And this is also uh, for us the understanding of a virtual space as a space which actually is not depending on any physical rules. So uh, we, uh, there is no gravity in virtual reality or in virtual space. Um, we can, there is no need to have a physical representation of our world. So it's just an empty space and we can fill it how we, we want. And this provides us a new a layer uh, to move on and to, um, with our also abstractness and organicity, uh, organ organic uh, shapes to explore a space which goes beyond the physical rules of our grids uh, where we live in our everyday lives. And this is the case of Neurotraces, uh, which is a project we developed between, um, actually started way before in 2018. It was not Neurotraces uh, with Manuel, but then uh, we developed together in 2020-21. Uh, in a team of four people, uh, also together with a programmer and neuroscientist. Uh, and it is a XR installation uh, exploring the relation of well-being and a virtual space. So basically, um, the project itself is an um, artistic installation, but we worked interdisciplinary. That means we uh, try to focus on a feedback loop between the human body and the virtual formation. And we work together with a neuroscientist who helped us in understanding what kind of data we could gather from an EEG and how we could translate this or trying to translate this in visuals, what kind of um, data we could use, what makes sense. And for us as artists, it was really exciting to see these things from another perspective, trying to understand um, more scientific elements, trying to see okay, what is actually possible or makes sense to explore. And for us, it, the main aspect was focusing on this feedback loop. So you have data coming from the body, and how do we translate this in, in a procedural way into the virtual? And also beautiful then to see what kind of different outputs we gathered, what feedback we got from the people testing it, and so on.
And so actually for us, it was really exciting this, um, so on the one hand, you had the EEG um, and uh, you were influenced or like your brainwave uh, was influenced by, the, by this virtual space. So it was interesting for us not having the influence of anything from the physical world, but just consider, okay, what is the virtual environment and how is this bringing into a feedback loop of being influenced and then sending the feedback to this uh, virtual design, which would change the lines, the thickness, the um, um, the amount of lines, the amount of uh, uh, like the density, the amount of points, and so on, depending on how you felt inside that space. Um, and it was, it is for us like something um, really that we love to explore this this feedback or this relation uh, between me being a space and how this space is also influencing me. And as we said at the beginning, it's really like going from so many different things, from the performance to uh, virtual reality installation um, and so on. So it's always like this, this starting from this concept vision uh, and not being conditioned by, okay, now I want to do a VR project or now I want to do this and just deciding it in a second moment uh, what the output will be. Um, and for us, uh, the, this experiment also with virtual space um, is something that, that we don't only want to provide for, for an audience and to, to experience it, but it's also something that we love to work with. Um, so we are also, uh, in, our, in our daily practice, we also work a lot and we also create spaces uh, directly in VR. Yeah, for, for us it's really important to, if we develop something for the medium VR, um, like our, for our VR games um, and we develop game spaces. For us, it's really important to make at least the rough models inside VR because we have already an instant feeling how this space will look like, how we can perceive it. Um, also, it's really beautiful to us um, working on a more intuitive workflows. We try to emphasize a lot on intuitive workflows, meaning that Modeling something with the mouse is the least intuitive thing. Um, then you have a, a pen, a tablet, and for us, way better is that you are really inside VR, you have the controllers, and you sculpt, model the things um, like in a physical way. You're, you're extremely fast, and the big advantage you have is that you don't see these objects just on the screen in 2D, but you see it in 3D, and you can scale it up in the scale you want it then to have in the final output. So if I model a room in a small size, I can scale it up and position myself in the one-on-one -on -one scale um, to have immediately an impression how this will look like. So this workflow in, in our company is really important and uh, yeah, we work a lot with it. I think it's also really coming back from the uh, architectural background is um, going beyond this grid and also what does it mean to live in organic space or is it even like possible so it's just in the virtual um, or is this, is, is this then reflecting also the way we inhabit physical spaces, just the way of I experience something organic and virtual and then maybe I start also understanding my physical space in a different way and um, just like this being uh, confined in these um, boxes and some, it's not something natural, it's something human made. Uh, and when we start talking about uh, also post-anthropocentric uh, uh, ideas and futures, it's uh, the organic um, nature uh, of our world, it's necessary to bring it back and to explore it also. How does it mean and is it possible? It's for us to live in this kind of spaces, uh, also in the future, maybe in some kind of a mixed uh, realm. And um, so to, to conclude, just overview, like we are not just super like uh, passionate to work in, in this kind of uh, topics to explore um, um, from, from experimental filmmaking to installations, games, uh, and so on. But we also, uh, we also love to, um, to get uh, feedback from the community, also to help the community. So Manuel and I are also the co-organizers of Xavienna, uh, which is Austria's first and largest uh, community of VR, AR, uh, MR professionals. And um, we are also um, teaching at different universities uh, here in Austria and all in, all in workshops, uh, mostly with uh, VR uh, game spaces and also um, in experimental uh, film. Um, and yes, we are uh, excited to start to stay in touch with you. If anybody's interested, uh, please uh, talk to us later. We will be around or just uh, write us an email. Thank you. So, I will try to come around here. Thanks a lot for your talk. Thank you.
So I was wondering, just a question I have in my mind, because I see all these, um, how to say, moving bodies of real people, and then at least you have kind of this abstraction. So my question would be, so um, abstraction, and maybe I would say as a, as a um, viewer, I have the feeling of a little bit of loss of the context. So how important is that for you, and what does it mean if you go that direction to kind of defragmentize um, the information in a way. Is there something you can tell about this? I think uh, it's a lot of to do with the perception and our, uh, also like how we perceive our world. And something that we love to experiment is what does it mean uh, also to disorient a little bit, maybe at the beginning, the, the viewer, because it's not just, we always want to start something that you know. It's the physical world and uh, like from the human perspective, we always say, okay, we know this is white and so on, and this is the color, or this is like our reality, uh, but we want a lot to bring also different perspectives and sometimes this relation uh, between the physical and the virtual to, to challenge it a bit and to say, actually, this comes from the physical, but this is not the physical that you know, and to then question what do we know about our physical world and uh, also to not have this strict division between uh, physical and virtual but saying there is a communication between both worlds and the digital world should not only be a representation or a copy of our physical one but bring new layers and, and so there can be this fragmentation that is really important for us. There can be also a little bit of this uh, disorientation of the audience, but in order to reach new perspectives and new ways of seeing also ourselves uh, and our environment. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Other questions here in the back? Yeah. Uh, one moment, you get a mic that we can catch your thoughts. I have a question uh, about the performance. So this was like... Um, bodily movement and, and then um, like transferred into um, say patterns, etc. cetera, um, uh, distinguishing um, bodily movement from uh, how the space uh, changes. So like um, yeah, there's kind of a time space uh, concept. And my question is, uh, could you flip the concept like, okay, so the performer is not performing but um, you write a script for um, the, the space that is changing all the time, and uh, then the performer should react on that like uh, the other way around, or maybe even without performer. Or, yeah, so then um, it would be like a, a script for um, um, the space instead of uh, for the bodily movement. Yeah, def definitely. This would <laughs> definitely work. Um, basically, um, we tried it a little bit in Neuro Traces. So this project, what you saw with, with the green lines, it, it was not directly in the sense that then someone performs, but there the, um, the space does something and you react on the space. In the sense of Neuro Traces, it was not performative. Uh, it was more like, how do you feel inside? How, how does it, what kind of affection it has on you? Uh, but yes, basically, you can do this, yes, especially with virtual reality, if you have spatial tracking, and yeah. Okay, thanks. Another question? So first of all, thank you so much for this inspiring talk, I loved it. Um, I was wondering, in this, I thought it was the second project, I forgot the name, sorry for that, whether like the actors or performers had to move and they could see their movements kind of transferred onto a screen, right? There they had the feeling of, I would say, of agency. I know when I move my arm, a, a line is drawn maybe. I was wondering, what about the EEG project kind of? Because their lines are also rendered on the screen, but I had no idea how I could control it kind of. You know what I mean? Bec and, and then, did you do anything not to make it feel random kind of? So they are just lines spawned but I don't feel that I am the person that spawns it. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. So I was wondering, did you do anything to, to prevent that? Yeah, basically during the development, it was a lot of back and forth with the neuroscientists. Um, if we should have some kind of control, let's say you can calm yourself down and the lines become red if you um, try to be more uh, higher pulse rate or something in that sense, other types of feedbacks, biofeedbacks, you change it. Um, at the end, we wanted to go against it because it's kind of you control the digital space. We wanted that it should be something 
um, not directly links, more unconsciously, so that you sit inside and you kind of, you feel that something happens, but you don't really understand it. Um, of course, it, it blurred a lot in between, uh, do I understand it, do I don't understand it? Um, at the same time, we had one, we had multiple screens, so on one screen you saw the EG data coming in, on the other side you, you saw the person with the headset plus the, the projection of it. So there was some kind of link between. Um, but yeah, the EG, um, if you're familiar with it, so the data itself is really, uh, you cannot really detect things, you have to go run it through an AI system to detect the patterns in order to um, change the, the parameters, yeah. Just to add something, I think, about this uh, topic of control. Uh, it's really interesting because, like, on the one hand, if we talk about this, like, for us with new traces, was really this trying also have the environment as a subject and not just like a, an object which is uh, being controlled by the human. Um, so it was also interesting to see like the reaction of the visitor. So we were also showing the project actually here, uh, the Arts Electronic and Salsamt in 2021, and as well as the Digital Art Festival in Zurich, um, among other events. And there were always like this almost one week um, exhibition and so many feedback and reaction from people and it was exciting sometimes really to see people waiting uh, to see how the space is developing for each one or what the outcome will be so uh, we had also time slots um, and where people okay I will come in two hours but maybe they just wanted to stay there uh, and to see Would how will it change for each person before yeah, them five minutes or? in in try to, to understand um, yeah the um, how like it if it's work, what is the control? And something which we're always talk, telling them is also like the output itself is not showing how you feel because some people, it, it, how you feel is so personal to you. So if you feel well in a space with a lot of particles or with less lines, uh, which is related to some other elements, uh, uh, which go back to the to the to the um, EG. Uh, th that doesn't mean that it's for everybody. Applicable. Maybe some people prefer a smaller room. Other people prefer a bigger room or space. And this is the same way in this abstractness. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the Q and A. Also, I would try to bring in Mr. Salter again to the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're running out of time a little bit in different ways. Um, so I was wondering, a question I have to you is um, yeah. all these um, yeah, coming back of the technology, then it vanishes again, then it comes back again, and so on. But at the very beginning, I guess, this um, extension of our view or whatever it was, was meant to be serious, right? It was meant to be a kind of a tool. Yeah. And now we are in a situation, I guess, we all see it, meta advertising, it's all gamification. You yeah. are 50 and you should play a little org with uh, yellow horns. What is going on there? This is my question. Yeah. Why do we lo lose the seriousness of these tools? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. So there's a lot of work in critical, what's called critical VR studies coming out of sociology of science. And one of the arguments that researchers are making, there's two researchers in Australia, if you're interested, Marcus Carter and Ben Eggleston. They've written about 20 articles in the last two years on the politics of the metaverse and of meta in general. And what they say is that ultimately, I mean, so for instance, you know, why, why, did, why did Meta buy uh, Oculus? You know, well, I mean, this was a small company, basically, for two billion US dollars. Well, they, you know, it, it seems like Zuckerberg is interested in gaming. And, and this, these researchers say, no, of course not, he's not interested in gaming, he's interested in data. Because the, the HMDs deliver, because of the amount of sensing, deliver so much data that in one study, they could identify the user 90% of the time just by their head movements, okay? So this is really interesting because you go back to Sutherland. The, the interesting thing is that Sutherland, when he started to develop the HMD, um, I, I don't, and does anyone know kind of the origin of virtual reality technologies? You know, I mean, you know, so Sutherland is, of course, one of them. Then there's Morton Selig. And there's a lot of different kind of disparate genealogies. But one of the interesting things is actually the, the, the probably the most, let's say, 
solid application of virtual reality was in mid-1960s at Bell Helicopter in Texas. And Bell Helicopter was, of course, developing technologies for the Vietnam War, and they wanted to figure out how to land helicopters in the dark. So they attached infrared cameras to the bottom of those helicopters and attached a kind of awkward facial display to the pilot with a motion tracker, uh, a very, very expensive Polhemus uh, motion tracker. And um, basically, as people turn their head, the cameras would turn. So this is this idea of like trying to basically substitute vision in the pilot. I mean, it's a cybernetic model, right? The pilot is basically tied up to the camera. So this is the early, and, and Sutherland went to Texas and he saw this happen, you know? And so he was inspired by this idea that, wow, if we could insert computing between the world and the body, we could basically, you know, create this kind of new world. And of course, he was, had already developed Sketchpad at MIT. So this very early origin is really key because this insertion of the computational overlaying into the, into the world was very important. So you know, now, of course, um, Meta is obsessed, of course, by the more sensors you have, the more, of course, the more data you get. You know, so I think I think this is one of the issues is that the you know the next Ocul the Oculus Quest Pro already has eye tracking. Um, you know, they start to see that pupillometry sensing will not only tell you emotional state, it will also tell you uh, sexual preference. It will tell you. I mean, so we're talking about things that are locked inside our bodies and our brains and our spirit that are basically going to be extracted by sensing technologies. So I, I think this is a huge question. You know, when you put one of these devices on, you're making a certain contract, you know, uh, <laughs> with the manufacturer. Yeah. Thanks. We have a question over here. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. Um, so for your project, you use the Oculus Quest 2, right? Yeah. And f when you leave your tracking area, you have this yeah, the pass guard, through, yeah. right? The, the, the thing that you that yeah. you said, um, it looks like television a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I was wondering, why did you use it then? So was it specifically or intentionally that you wanted to create this atmosphere? Because there's a MetaQuest Pro, for example, that has like a yeah, that more colorful of, picture. Well, so, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so that wasn't out of the time. The other thing is, like, MetaQuest Pro is $1,200, and if you put 15 of those, you know, so you run into scale problems. I mean, this is a huge problem. They just did this in Bayreuth with, you know, 300 people wearing kind of uh, and real glasses and only, you know, 300 people in t audience of 2,000 could see what was going on. So scale problems, the economics are really problematic of these devices. Uh, the second is um, we wanted originally to use um, Magic Leap, you know, and we did seven months of testing and research and simply the technology could not deliver what we wanted to use, you know. So um, when the, when the pass-through came out, or let's say the access to the pass-through, because for instance, HTC Vive has pass-through, but you can't access it. We thought, well, this is interesting because, you know, it's just so weird, it's so grainy, it's interesting aesthetically, you know, for us. And a lot of people say this, they like, they find this so strange that you were wearing this expensive technology with this grainy camera. And I mean, you know, so that's what art is. It's not about trying to mimic what Hollywood does. If you want to do that, go work for Digital Domain, you know? So, and, and, and people comment on that, you know, it's like, it feels like the beginning of something, you know? And that's part of, I think, you know, the kind of media archeology span of those systems. So, and that's also that kind of tension people have between like watching this live theater thing and then watching this grainy image, you know, which is like, and then suddenly this thing in, in that grainy image that you could not have done, you know, 10 years ago. So yeah, that was very, very conscious choice. Uh, and it also was very much a practical choice. You know, we had six months to make this thing happen uh, and a lot of money riding on it and a lot of 35 people, you know, and it had to be done. So it's like, okay, you, you adapt to the constraints of the technology, you know, and it's really, that's a super interesting question too because I have never as an artist been in a cycle of production where you're dependent, so coupled to a corporation to deliver the next update of the SDK in order to do something. So you're constantly, okay, now the, you know, now the space your anchors is gonna work, now they don't work. Now they, so you're really, I mean, we are coupled, um, you know, we are coupled to these systems in ways that people like Sutherland were not. Yeah. Thank you, we would have one more question, then we have to, 
land over to Mr. Yeah, Budelka, okay, it's me. I hope. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you very Hi. much for your talk. And uh, I, I want to go back to the performance. Yeah. Um, so the aim of the performance is like a feeling uh, the climate change. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you, you did it by, um, let's say, uh, by uh, VR um, uh, technology. Yeah. So nowadays, it's also possible uh, to, to do it in a telepresence, so first-person view um, uh, technology with drones. Oh, yeah. uh, this really um, makes the body um, react um, very, very heavily on, on uh, vertigo, uh, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, um, being uh, on the ground with two, uh, with your two feet on the ground is still, you know, like um, a, a bit more safe than feeling that you fly. And uh, I wonder, how, would you have chosen for this this uh, this variant of uh, this kind of uh, technology if 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 you could uh, use it? Um, that's a great question. No, um, it's really interesting. You say it's very stable. So many people, when they're wearing a VR headset, of course, still get vertigo. Why? Because there's no floor, right? Um, so when, <laughs> it's really interesting when you're wearing a headset and you're holding on to a rope and you're just walking on this flat surface, when you suddenly walk over some gravel, people feel like they're f falling into another space. So I, I don't think you have to use the most sophisticated technologies for technologies, say, Especially, it's like I said, it's, it's like theater, you know. So, for instance, someone said, oh, I felt like, you know, you have some kind of irrigation. I felt this kind of cloud of mist on me. I said, you mean our $1 spray bottle of water? <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it, it, it goes again back to, like, like, why you make something in the first place. Is it designed to be a technological demo? I mean, you use a technology to do what it, it can do, you know? But, um, I mean, I would never think about trying to think about the, let's say, uh, uh, enact the kind of questions around environment and body and, and, and the habits and climate uh, using a technology which is not rooted, basically, you know, on, 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 the, on the earth itself. So, yeah. That's a, it's a very interesting question, though. And I was talking to a researcher, Dario Fagliano, uh at APFL, who's actually working on that whole question about basically bodily perception uh, using drones. And people, of course, um, you know, that they use the birdie system that Max Reiner, uh, Reiner developed at Said Hadeka, where you kind of lie on a table, and people get, like, throw up, basically, you know, in terms of because they get so sick on this kind of system as this trying to adapt to so-called drone vision, you know. So, so I think human vision that is constantly in this tension between, you know, because you know, these systems are artificial. <laughs> Technology is an artifice. And you should use it like that and not pretend it's like something that it's not. So, yeah. Thanks, though. So, thanks Thank a you. lot. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. We have a tight schedule. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, next up we are with Vladimir Kutelka. He is a visual artist and computer game creator. And he's a two-time finalist of the IGF Awards at the Independent Games Festival in San Francisco. And he is the re recipient of uh, the Czech Game of the Year Award. Um, he released two game titles, After Glitch in 2022 and before that, Remember It in 2015. And right now, he's focusing on his startup, Wrapped. And in his talk, it shall go about um, searching for parallel words, is the title, in game development. And he will give an insight behind the scene and design process of After Glitch and how its boundary-pushing world became blurred between a computer game and a spiritual experience. Thanks a lot <laughs> to come. We have a little...
So hello, it's a great pleasure for me to stand before you and uh, looking back at the seven year development of Aftergrage, uh, which, oh, we don't have a video. real time I hope it will work now <laughs> So, okay, it's, uh, After Glitch is about looking back uh, uh, the seven year development of After Glitch, uh, which uh, represents more than just a span of time in my life. Uh, it's a journey. It's a journey filled with inspiration, passion, and discoveries, and a profound understanding of how art, science, and technology. Uh, can come together and uh, when one embarks on a creative process the final product is often unclear and although the primary intention of the after glitch was to allow player become an astronaut uh, seeking extraterrestrial civilization um, but over time I realized that what truly matters is the journey itself. Uh, this philosophy not only became the foundation of the gaming experience, but also reflected my life during these seven years. Uh, the movies I watch, uh, the art that resonated with me, the scientific discoveries that inspired me, and the games that amazed me. And I have to say, uh, all these sources uh, motivated me to create something unique. And over time, After Glitch became not just a game, but a more personal expression of how the journey can be much more valuable uh, than the final destination for me. And. Uh, Today, um, my goal is to share with you not only the story of After Glitch, but also to unveil the beauty and passion and challenges that come with a long-term uh, creative process. I hope that my words and the game inspire you um, as much as many other facets of art and science inspired me over the years, and it was seven years of the development. So 
So inspiration number one for me, movies. And I like connecting through space, spirit and time and the intersection of philosophy and cinematography. And in a series of uh, cult films spanning half a century of cinematography, uh, one can find profound themes um, exploring our existence, uh, place in the universe, and the quest for higher meaning. Uh, films like uh, 2001 a Space Odyssey from Stanley Kubrick or Interstellar from uh, Christopher Nolan or uh, my the most favorite movie uh, Aronofsky's The Fountain and the works of Terence Malick. And while differing in directional style and narrative, share a deep fascination with these questions. Um, space context and the search for meaning. Uh, both Stanley Kubrick and Christopher Nolan in their films 2001 A Space Odyssey and Interstellar uh, depict the universe as infinite, mysterious and inhospitable, uh, yet hiding uh, the key to understanding our existence. Uh, while Kubrick uh, delves into evolution of the human race, uh, influenced by the monolith, Nolan focuses on saving humanity from extinction by turning to cosmic horizons and black holes. Both directors grapple with the question of human life's meaning in the vast universe. Uh, the cyclical nature of life and death, Aronofsky's The Fountain, is a profound meditative portrayal of the cyclical nature of life, death, and rebirth. And similar to Malik's film, which often depict lives in the various phases and forms, uh, Aronofsky examines how an individual copes with the inevitability of death and the possibility of eternal life. And uh, these themes are also presented in uh, Malik's movie, The Tree of Life, where the view, viewer embarks on a journey from the universe inception to um, individual's death. For me, very important is some kind of spiritual quest. When Ter Terence Malick's films, particularly The Tree of Life and Voyage of Time, delve deeply into the spiritual quest. Through memories, dreams, and meditations of characters, the view viewer is taken into the depth of the human soul. The spiritual exploration can also be seen in The Fountain, where the quest for immortality cure leads to the protagonist to understand deeper truth about life and death. And uh, while all these films have their unique storytelling techniques, uh, visual styles and thematic differences, they are united by deep philosophical and spiritual quests. Uh, in a world where science and technology continually push the boundaries of our knowledge, uh, these films remind us that some of the most significant existential questions uh, remain unanswered. And it's this quest for meaning, a connection with the universe and understanding our place in that makes these films timeless. And my big inspiration number two, art. 
and it is the painting of uh, Salvador Dali. It is uh, famous Salvador Dali's Corpus Hypercubus. Uh, uh, and Salvador Dali is known for his surrealistic artistic style and he crafted numerous works that pulled the viewer into a realm of fantasy and dreams. And among these pieces stands Corpus Hypercubus, a painting that depicts a crucified Christ on a cross formed from a hypercube or a four-dimensional cube. Uh, this portrayal carries distinct sci-fi elements, setting it apart from traditional religious images. So, uh, sci-fi and four-dimensional geometry. Uh, the concept of uh, four-dimensional space often correlates with modern physical theories and concepts that find their place in a science fiction tales. And the hypercube as a four-dimensional object embodies this idea and uh, frequently linking it to the realm of science fiction. And that is choice of the hypercube as Christ's cross may seem to viewers as an intersection of the sci-fi world with a uh, religious image. A futuristic view on a traditional, traditional subject. So uh, crucifixion is among the most uh, recurrent subject in Christian art. And however, Dali's interpretation is, uh, is exceptionally uh, distinct. Uh, while preserving the symbolism of the crucified Christ, he introduced uh, futuristic elements of the tradi traditional theme. So uh, this blend of a conventional religious topic with a modern futuristic depiction carries a sci-fi nature since it uh, disrupts our anticipations and leads us to fresh interpretations of a familiar tale. and very important for me is light and space and that is portrayal themes with contrast between darkness and light and reminiscence of the visual style of numerous sci-fi films and books. Uh, light emanates from Christ's body, uh, illuminating the face of his mother Mary, which can be understood as a reflection of uh, diving light within this cosmic space. And this visual technique uh, bestows the painting with a mystical and supernatural ambience and commonly associated with science fiction. Uh, in Corpus Hypercubus, uh, Salvador Dali marries religious and sci-fi elements, uh, accompanying us to reassess our understanding of conventional theme and by amalgamating a time-honored theme with modern and futuristic facets. Uh, Dali demonstrates how art can expand our perception of challenge our presumption. At the intersections of space times. And this very linkage of an um, ancient tale with a modern interpretation uh, renders Corpus Hypercubus not merely as a surrealistic piece, but also as a work uh, bearing a pronounced sci-fi character. So inspiration number three is uh, design and design world around me. So the basic shapes, uh, circle, triangle, and square, and uh, symbols in sci-fi and their significance. Uh, sci-fi, a genre celebrated for its exploration of the future universe and technology, also frequently engages with universal symbols, 
that very profound uh, significance of the human psyche. And among the most notable and uh, pervasive are simple geometric shapes. The circle, triangle and square. And uh, these forms not only deliver aesthetic value, but also act as a metamorph for complex concepts that we grapple with both in the real life and in the fantastical realms of sci-fi. So, uh, circle, uh, cycle and infinity. In uh, numerous cultures, the circle is esteemed as a symbol of infinity, perfection and wholeness. And Within Stiffy, the circle is frequently observed in form like spaceship portals or stargates. And circular portals often enable time travel of movement between various dimensions and reflecting the idea of endless possibilities and cycles. And additionally, this shape can represent a planet, galaxy, or even the enigmatic allure of a black hole. On the other hand, a triangle, conflict, and harmony. With its three sides and points, the triangle can represent the dynamic among three different elements. Uh, it's frequently surfaced in sci-fi as a symbol of conflict, uh, tension, and balance between three forces or characters. It can also symbolize a hierarchy where uh, the triangle's apex represents the ut utmost authority of power, and triangular shapes might also be uh, incorporated into the design of spaceship or other technologies. Uh, emphasizing their advanced and aggressive nature. And square, uh, stability and order. Uh, for me, uh, the square stands as a symbol of stability, uh, solidity and order. Uh, in the sci-fi uh, realm, uh, this shape might represent cities, space stations or other stru structures. Uh, a dead firm, unstable construction. The square and also, also symbolize a dogmatic and rigid uh, structures where everything Germany. is governed by strengthened rules. Uh, conversely, when uh, contrasted with the chaotic and uncontrollable universe, a square structure might uh, signify humanity's attempt to impose order and control over the unknown. And while Sifi often delves into advanced technologies and distant worlds, it uh, doesn't neglect universal symbols that resonate with the human heart and mind. Uh, the circle, triangle and square aren't merely aesthetic elements, but serve as storytelling tools about infinite cycles, conflicts and order in the cosmos. And through these symbols, uh, sci-fi can communicate ideas and concepts in straightforward and uh, comprehensible forms. So inspiration number four, video games. Uh, Progressive and alternative video games, uh, the importance of new narratives in the digital age. Uh, the video game industry has witnessed an extraordinary evolution over the past few decades, and 
beyond traditional games uh, that emphasize action and gameplay mechanics, uh, progressive and alternative video games have emerged in recent years, uh, pushing the boundaries of what can be expressed within the medium. And for me, uh, titles such as uh, Tear Esther or The Stranding uh, showcase the potential of games and an art form and as platforms for deep and emotional storytelling. So I'm searching for uh, new forms of narration. Uh, traditional video games often focus on specific gameplay mechanics like combat, racing, or strategy. And progressive and alternative games like Dear Esther shift their focus more towards narration and ambience. Uh, for example, um, in the Esther, players explore a desolate island while listening uh, to the fragmented monologues of a character. And this gaming experience more closely uh, resembles an interactive film or book rather than a typical game and offering a fresh approach to the digital narration. Uh, Death Stranding from Hideo Kojima uh, is renowned for its intricacy and profound philosophical undertones. And uh, while it does incorporate traditional gameplay mechanics, its story characters and world unco uncover uh, intricate themes about isolation and interconnectedness and the human experience in a post-apocalyptic setting. Uh, progressive games often take risk by addressing complex or uh, controversial topics. Um, broadening avenues for discussion and the reflection within the gaming community. So I think alternative video games frequently experiment with uh, novel gameplay mechanics, which can influ influence the entire industry, although players might sometimes find uh, these innovations uh, disorienting. For me, uh, progressive and alternative video games are not just about entertainment. Uh, uh, they stand as a taste that video games can be recognized as an art form on pair with movies, literature or theater. Uh, they offer novel ways to narrate stories and expand the limits of what can be uh, conveyed through interactive media. And like I said, games like uh, Dear Esther and The Stranding illustrate how this genre can enrich our culture and aesthetic experiences. So inspiration number five is technology and its technology in video games and photorealism in video games and the paradox of altering real reality through a photogrammetry. And I think the world of video gaming has undergone a tremendous transformation over the decades. Uh, one of the major advancements that have captured the attention of both developers and gamers like is the trend toward photorealism. Uh, we have Quixel Mega Scans and others. And uh, we can explore the role of photorealism in the video games 
it's like with, with photogrammetry and the paradox of using these tools to distort reality into something maybe fresh and unprecedented. So I think photorealism in video games refers to the rendering of game environments, characters and objects in a manner that they closely mimic their real world counterparts. So such a realism is not just a testament to the advancement in graphic technology, but also represents a drive of immersive player in a world that feels a uh, tangible, uh, real table and alive. So this technique uh, that involves capturing high resolution photographs of a real world, objects and environments, and then converting these photographs into 3D models. Uh, video game developers have uh, employed photogrammetry to generate detailed and lifelike assets uh, for their games. And for example, the rock, trees and buildings in certain modern games might be directly modeled after real world uh, equivalents. However, mm, as with any tool or technology, its application is only limited uh, by, na, by the imagination of its user. And herein lies the paradox. Uh, uh, while photogrammetry can be employed to create a perfect replica of the real world, in the gaming universe, it can also be manipulated to craft a reality that is distorted, surreal, or entirely new. The details uh, captured by the technology can be altered or reshaped uh, or repurposed to fabricate a world that, that defies logic, gravity, or any known laws of physics. Uh, an example of this can be seen in games that take place in dreamlike landscapes where mountains uh, float, uh, rivers flow upwards, and buildings defy architecture norms. And these altered real realities, while based on the real world assets captured using photogrammetry, are tweaked and transformed to create settings that are both unfamiliar and captivating. And I think uh, photorealism as delivered by photogrammetry offers player a uh, touchstone, a sense of familiarity. Uh, yet when this reality is twist, uh, it challenges perceptions and evokes uh, curiosity and invites exploration. And in this manner, uh, photorealistic games can serve as both a mirror to our world and a uh, window to a realm of pure imagination. So in conclusion, while the quest for photorealism in video games reflects our desire to immersion and authenticity, the paradoxical use of tools like photogrammetry showcase the boundless creativity of the human mind by uh, harnessing the power of these technologies. Uh, developers can craft experiences that not only mirror our re reality, but also challenge and expand our, uh, our understanding of what reality can be.
So my inspiration number six, signs. And over the past few decades, uh, the concept of parallel worlds has resonated not only in uh, literature and films, but also within uh, scientific disciplines. And the notion that could exist more than one universe uh, once seemed purely fantastical for me. And how, however, uh, advancements in quantum physics and cosmology have crowned this idea in scientific, scientific uh, foundation. So the exploration of parallel worlds uh, within science mainly started with quantum mechanics. And one of the significant paradoxes in quantum mechanics is the double slit experiment, uh, where a particle uh, can pass through both slits uh, simultaneously and producing an interface pattern. Uh, to resolve this paradox, uh, the many worlds interpretation emerged uh, according to uh, this theory when a quantum system encounters an observation it doesn't collapse into one specific state instead uh, the universe splits uh, creating parallel universes for all possible states of the system So this means for every quantum possibility, uh, there exists a parallel universe where that possibility, where that possibility has uh, materialized. And parallel universes are also contemplated in cosmology, uh, scientists investigate whether our universe might be just one of many uh, bubble universes uh, within a large multiverse. Uh, these bubbles might arise from the inflationary theory, uh, describing a period of rapid expansion of uh, the universe uh, shortly after the Big Bang. And if this theory holds a numerous universes with uh, varying physical constraints and laws could exist. So the, the idea of parallel worlds uh, is enchanting and it faces several challenges. Uh, significant hurdle is that, by definition, uh, parallel universes would be inaccessible for direct observation. Uh, this raises the question of whether this theory is uh, scientific at also uh, at all science original science uh, requires theories to be uh, verifiable and falsiable. So for me, uh, the concept of parallel worlds opens a plethora of intriguing questions and avenues for understanding the reality uh, in which we live. Uh, while we are far from uh, conclusively uh, confirming or refuting uh, the existence of parallel worlds, um, this idea uh, will likely continue to inspire and challenge the mind of both sightings and uh, lay people. And this reminds me of the words of the famous writer Philip K. Dick. And he once said, uh, reality is that which when you stop believing in it, it doesn't go away. So these days, our belief seems to be challenging all the time. New technologies and art give us new views of different realities. So thank you very much for your attention. I will come to you. So.
Yeah, thanks a lot. Quite hypnotic, I have to say. <laughs> I don't know how you feel. <laughs> I'm a little dizzy now. Um, okay, there would be so many questions, but I'm not really sure if I can uh, formulate them in a pr profound way. Um, so there is this scientific base you use with uh, big enthusiasm and also their kind of symbolism. Um, so the question for me is, you are working seven years on something like that? Are you yes, alone exactly. working on that? Or are you with people? I'm asking cause, I guess, to reflect this complexity and also this, mm, it's not real, really diametrical, but it's kind of not, uh, say, it's not a clear thing to use symbolism and scientific approaches. Um, how do you reflect it and how can you get along for seven years with that? This would be, it's a hard question, I know, but <laughs> this would interest me totally. And meanwhile, I look into the audience and if someone has a question, show up. Uh, so, I really love Kazimir Malevich and suprematism. And it is the foundation for me of all the world around me. So, uh, these geometric shapes and uh, following Bauhaus schools and other. So uh, in my mind, I am an artist and I really love technology and science around. So I read a lot of physical books and I love these theories about parallel worlds and string theory, which is very important for me. So it formed after which for all the years. And uh, I have to say, uh, all the development was very hard for me. There was a lot of depressions, and, and I didn't see any ways how to go further. Uh, I stopped that project many times. So uh, I am happy it exists right now. And uh, uh, it is very hard to describe after glitch. So that's why I, I have played this video to you, because if I will speak about something you don't know what it's about, it will be very, very, very hard for you. So um, I think uh, watching after glitch is hard too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so <laughs> that's how it goes for me. No? I mean, I can totally relate to this world, definitely. So I guess we have similar um, favorites in movies and things like that. <laughs> uh, one question I have before I hand it over. Um, one uh, reverence that came to my mind when I saw it, and I just wanted to ask if it can be one, is uh, the, the Isle of Death from Arnold Böcklin. You know this artist? Because he influenced Dali a lot. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. For me, the most important was uh, Dali's uh, Corpus Hypercubus. I think it was isolated for me, that painting in my mind. Uh, so I think there is nothing further for me, uh, for mm -hmm. inspiration and, and like this. Because from my art studies, uh, I always have every day in my mind uh, that Corpus Hypercubus painting in my head. Okay. And I really like a uh, hypercube as a symbol. Uh, it's it's very, very interesting. And uh, if you read about it, it's it's really, really, really beautiful. And, and your mind can explode. So so it's really interesting for me. But I was a little bit isolated. It was uh, Dali, these movies, and a lot of uh, super string theory on this. Mm -hmm. so some people ask if string theory is art. Is it science? Uh, for people me. are not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's please, a question <laughs> over there. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. Um, putting it simply, we have these two perspectives, right? We have the super artistic perspective that is super important for this project, but it's still a game, right? So we also have this important aspects like playability, usability, and stuff like this. So for example, uh, I don't know, rules have to be defined. The user has to know how to control the player and stuff like this. Was it hard for you to kind of like find a balance between these two? They're not opposite, but, but still like between these two aspects of a game? Uh, it was very hard because, uh, I don't know, sometimes I am on some kind of border uh, between interactive installation and video game. But uh, from, from my childhood, I am a big gamer. Uh, so this medium is very important for me and I, 
I want to create something new and something innovative, but uh, to be honest, the, the gameplay is not so important for me these days. And uh, for example, I re really like uh, walking simulators. Yeah, when you only walk and uh, listening some kind of story and. I know the gameplay is not most very important for me. Uh, but uh, after glitch is not very hard. You only control the uh, astronaut, you only walk, but you have to figure out in every scene what to do and how to end that scene, which is sometimes pain for you. <laughs> mm. Does answer the question? Yeah. Thank you. Are there further more questions in the audience? Get, take the chance, there's a microphone coming around to you. Maybe a short technical question. Um, it looks like that it's um, interesting to use it in a VR uh, technology. But um, maybe you're getting sick and I didn't see it on uh, Steam and other platforms as a VR uh, technology right now. Mm. Uh. I think you, I have tried a lot of in VR and I started a VR company this year and after glitch was uh, mm, seven years ago I started a project as desktop and VR but the motion sickness was the main problem and uh, when you start rotating the space around you uh, it's extremely bad for, for the player. And for me, and I think I'm strong <laughs> in, in VR, and uh, I do not have motion sickness very often. But when I rotate space around me, it's very bad for me personally. So I wasn't able to develop the game for VR when I was sick from that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, I would say thank you a lot for your talk. Thank you very much. And we'll finish the panel with that. Thank you. Thank you. Vladimir Kuldelka. Ah, vielleicht noch ganz kurz. <lacht> uh, hier geht es weiter um 14 Uhr. Und ja, ich lade Sie herzlich ein, wiederzukehren. Um, dazwischen gibt es Dinge im Deep Space etc. Aber es geht weiter die nächsten zwei Tage, drei Tage. Ah, <lacht> sorry. Totally slipped out of the roll. Ja, um, yeah. so come back 1400 or 2 p.m. Uh, The next panel will come up and yeah, we still have two days, also this day and another two days, um, to listen to different talks. Thanks a lot for your visit. Come back. Bye-bye. <laughs>